Obviously the easiest thing. <laughs> Our final speaker is Tom Spanbauer. <laughs> he is the godfather of dangerous writing. He knows your novel. You're taking my one, I would say. <laughs> It's true. He knows your book better than you do. Uh, because it's my birthday, I will mention <laughs> that I did an art beat story about Tom for OPB TV. When I first pitched it, they said, eh, stories about writers, you know, they're not very active. <laughs> they're not really good television, sorry. And I said, my story about Tom will have a lot of action in it. <laughs> and I made him ride a horse. <laughs> you can still watch it at opb.org. Oh, yeah. Tom told me to pick a sentence. Dangerous writing. So, dangerous <laughs> writing, right. Exactly. How did I forget to? Right on the spot, say the <laughs> uh, I picked a, a sentence out of Tom's new book, I Love You More. And you should all run out and buy it if you don't already have it. Hell yeah. And the sentence is the sentence that some of you have now. Fear is fear is fear. And what I am afraid of is being afraid. Church. 
But there was this one afternoon, it was back in the migraine days, so I was five, maybe six, Barbara was nine, definitely before I started going to school. That afternoon, Mom was in charge of the St. Joseph's rummage sale, and after lunch, she drove the Buick into Pocatello. As soon as Mom was gone, Barbara jumped on her bike and headed for her friend Judy's house a mile away. Dad was never at home during the day. It was safe as safe as it could be. The chrome strip with the chrome nails on the blue carpet was where their bedroom started. My Buster Browns were right up against the chrome strip. I don't know how long I stood there. Inside the room, in the mirror on Mom's vanity, I could see my two skinny legs and my Levi's. The room was, was dark and felt cold and smelled of beeswax and Dad's feet. The beeswax was nice, but mixed in with Dad's feet stunk. Behind me, the light from the picture window and the front room pushed my shadow over the chrome strip with the chrome nails. And even though I wasn't in their room yet, my shadow was. My reflection was in there, too. For my mother's wedding, her mother gave her two gifts. A four-piece mahogany bedroom set and a Holstein cow. <laughs> Inlay mom called the design on each of the pieces of the bedroom set, a swoop of wood grain and golden lines that was smooth on my fingers. On the headboard of the bed, inlay stretched from mom's side of the bed to dad's side. The bed was under the window with the shade. There were two feather pillows on the bed and a white chenille bread spread. The bed was always made. Then there was a chest of drawers with inlay just on the top drawer. The chest of drawers was on mom's side of the bed. On top of the chest of drawers on a crocheted dust cloth, a glow-in-the-dark statue of St. Joseph, and not a glow statue of Mary, just blue and white with her hands, palms up. At Mary's feet, woven palm frond from Palm Sunday. Just next to the door, the third piece, the maiden's chest with inlay on the built-in clock, the, number Roman, the numbers Roman numerals, old and yellow, that was never plugged in. The maiden's chest was a big cedar chest and was called a maiden's chest because mom was just a girl when she married dad. Inside the maiden's chest was full of old stuff that mom's mother and her sister made before her wedding doilies and crochet comforters and an emerald green knitted shawl. Also the lace tablecloth we put on the table on Christmas Day. Besides the maiden's chest, it didn't smell of cedar. Inside the maiden's chest, it didn't smell of cedar. It smelled of moth bottles. Sometimes mom called the maiden's chest her hope chest. In the drawer at the bottom was a photo album, snapshots of mom and dad with a lot of people I didn't know. Back when mom was a beautician and dad was a bachelor. Men in suits who looked like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and women dressed up in fancy dresses. Jean Tierney and Vivian Leigh smoking cigarettes and drinking cocktails and laughing and talking, young and full of hope and happy, just having a ball. Then there was the vanity with a big round mirror, two sets of inlay drawers on either side, and in the middle section between the two sets of drawers, the top was lower down so when mom sat at the matching silk cover covered stool, when she crossed her legs, she could see her knees and her nine lines in the mirror. In Hollywood movies, you see women sitting at vanities like moms. Only in the movies, the women have powder puffs and lipstick and makeup and sometimes light bulbs around the mirror. Mom's vanity wasn't like that. She, was a she wasn't a beautician anymore. On the top of her vanity on the left on the doily was a stand-up picture of our mother perpetual help holding the baby Jesus. And on the right, the card a, was a carved cedar box. The vanity was really the only place in the room that you could find a mom. Not so much the vanity, but in the covered cedar box that sat on the right of her vanity. In that box you could find, you could still find the mom who she was when she was somebody before dad met her. There's something you should know. 
I'd actually, I'd actually stepped over that chrome line a couple times before, so I knew a little bit about things, but nothing like I know that day. Safe. I thought I was safe. <clears throat> when I stepped my Buster Browns over that chrome line that afternoon, into where my sister and I were forbidden to go, I walked straight to the vanity and slid the matching stool with the Japanese flowers out from under the vanity. It took some lifting to get myself up onto the stool. When I got on top, I sat straight. I sat up straight on the silk cushion and looked at myself the way she used to look at herself. All those smi smiling photos in the maiden's chest. I crossed my legs. I could see my knees. On the vanity to the right, on the doily, mom's carved cedar box, the little clasp on the cedar box. When you put your finger under the clasp and lifted, what a smell when you open that box. Nothing in the world like that smell. Cedar, the temple Solomon built of God's house. Also inside were shiny brooches and earrings and jewels and hair combs and bobby pins. One gold-colored tube of lipstick that when you pulled the top cylinder off and turned the bottom, the lipstick rose up higher and higher, but not too high, just enough to see the dented to her lips red. But I never put the lipstick to my lips. I always turned the red back down, back inside, so you couldn't see it down inside there in the dark. Tinny, brassy sound of sliding the cylinder back into the tube. Then there was the purple bottle of evening in Paris that my mother's older sister, who never married maiden Aunt Alma, had bought for mom at a fancy lady shop called La Vines in the Idaho Hotel. Once I picked up the purple blue bottle and smelled it at the top, the evening at Paris smell was so strong all of a sudden it was all over my hands. I put the bottle back, closed the car, cedar box back up, slid the stool back in under the vanity. All I could smell was evening in Paris, no matter what I did. It was everywhere. I washed my hands three times, four times, but still the smell. I ran outside the pig pen, to the pig pen, crawled over the fence into the pig pen of the pigs, and scooped up handfuls of pig shit, and squeezed the pig shit through my fingers again and again, but still evening in Paris. <laughs> that night at the dinner table, my father kept looking over to me, his black eyes that knew everything, the sunburn line across his forehead where his Stetson was, his rolled up Levi's shirt sleeves, his hairy arms, the way he made his body stone. He could smell it. I knew he could smell evening in Paris. It was only a matter of time. So when I poured salt on my potatoes, he slapped my ear because of too much salt, he said. But really, he slapped my ear because of evening in Paris. After that, whenever I opened my mother's carved cedar box, I made sure to not touch the purple blue bottle. Never again touch evening in Paris. But mostly in mom's carved cedar box, besides the lipstick, there were two things I liked the most. A red pastry rose that she'd sliced off her wedding cake, and her diamond ring she didn't wear because the stone was loose. The rose was red and wasn't a tea rose. It was a rose, it was more of a floribunda rose, and its bloom was small and round and crusty. The, bell, the petals over the years were worn down and really it was more brown than red. The ring, the ring was especially magical, a gold ring with a diamond. From out of its silver, silver, tiny silver box, I pulled the diamond ring from out of the slot in the cushy purple velvet, always really careful, and hold the diamond ring in the palm of my hand. Once in a while, I'd tap the ring against the mirror just to hear the sound. But I never put the ring on, except for one time. The little red rose, I always wanted to take a little bite out of. I did that one time, too. And one time, the red lipstick on my lips. 
That afternoon when I walked by Buster Brown's over the chrome line after I'd hauled myself onto the stool and was looking at myself the way she looked at herself in the mirror, when I crossed my legs and looked at my knees, when I put my finger under the clasp that day, what a smell when I opened that box. The same smell as other days, but like all the other days, this time the smell was brand new. Nothing in the world like that smell, cedar and evening in Paris. The gold tube of lipstick was what I reached for first. I was just pulling the gold cylinder off, and from out of nowhere, there was Barbara standing right next to me, just as tall as me, sitting down, the breath inside me, high in my chest. Barbara scooted her bum in next to me on the sofa cushion, made herself right at home. She was my companion, and there was no one else. Barbara went to school and could write and spell. The way she was smiling, I knew I was in for it. In our family, there wasn't a lot of love that went around. And when love did go around, everybody grabbed for it, meaning Barbara and I. Dad was God the Father and also Joseph and looked like Rory Calhoun. In our little hierarchy, Dad was top dog because he was the man and men are the ones who command things. Dad's the one who took you out to the back shed, shed and whipped your bare bum with a little switch. Mom was the Virgin Mary who looked like Jean Tierney. She spanked you and scolded you, but for the worst, the worst thing she could do was say, wait till I tell your father about this. Really though, mom was top dog, but really we were Catholic. She had been, really though, mom was top, was, really though, mom was top dog, but because we were Catholic, she had promised to honor and obey her husband. If it weren't for that promise, mom would have been top dog for sure. Barbara was a girl like mom, but looked more like dad. Barbara was no Jane Tierney. Plus she was a girl, so Barbara had to obey men too. Barbara hadn't promised mom like promised like mom had. And even though Barbara was a top dog too, still that's just the way things were. Men came before women. Maybe that's why my mom didn't like Barbara much. Because Barbara was a girl and wasn't beautiful. Mom was disappointed in Barbara the way dad was disappointed in me. What all this boils down to is a family of four living together in a square white house on a high, windy Idaho plain. A little bit of front lawn, one tree, a weeping willow. Dad, Mom, Barbara, me. Mostly it was us against them, Barbara and Tommy against Mom and Dad, except when Barbara was on Dad's side against me, which happened a lot. Or I was on Mom's side against Barbara, which wasn't ever that big of a deal. At least no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make it into a big deal. What was really the big deal was if I wasn't like Dad. But nobody seemed to care if Barbara wasn't like Mom. But the truth is, I was like Dad, meaning I wasn't like them. And Mom and Barbara could get even with the commander, God the Father, Rory Calhoun, Top Dog, Dad, Man, by taking it out on me. But the worst of all was when but the worst of all was when it was mom against dad or vice versa. Mom and dad fighting. That world was not a place that you could exist in. All Barbara and I could do was go lie under her bed. It was chaos. It was hell. Anyway, we were all enemies. Barbara's brown curls, her dress with a red ribbon at the collar, her smile. The Spandauer smile, Dad's teeth, not Mom's teeth, but all crowded in. By then I should have known more about that smile. And there she was, my big sister, sitting next to me on the silk cushion vanity stool. There was a scab on her knee. Barbara, my guardian angel, my devil. I had no other choices. Let me help you, Barbara said. I already know how to do it. Barbara took the lipstick tube from my hand. Her dark brown eyes wrinkled up and she looked just at the end of the red sticking out. She turned the bottom and the red lipstick started to poke out more. Put your lips like this, she said. Barbara puckered her lips out like when, our, when you are grown up and want to kiss. Dad always said if Barbara says jump, then Tommy would say how high. 
Of course I did not, as I was told. I usually did. With Barbara, I never knew I had any other choice. I puckered my lips. Barbara started on my upper lip and the upper lip and the middle under my nose. That smell. From that moment on, for the rest of my life, the color red was going to be that lipstick smell. One quick swoop down to the corner of my mouth, then up top again under my nose, and one quick swoop down that side, one long slide along the bottom lip. Now pat your lip. Now pat your lips together. Now pat your lips together like this. Barbara pulled, pulled her lips in a little open and closed her mouth fast a bunch of times. So did I. There she said, you look gorgeous. Barbara sat up from her cushion and moved her body to the mirror. She did her, she slid her bum onto that part of the top of the vanity in between with the floor and the drawers. She pulled her face, her lips right up next to the mirror and she took her lips. Red lipstick at the top of her lip. One quick swoop down to the corner of her mouth, then up at the top of the lip again under her nose. One quick swoop down that side. One slide along her bottom lip, then Barbara opened and closed her mouth fast a bunch of times. And just like that, Barbara's lips were red. It was such a surprise to see Barbara's lips red. And I was looking at Barbara's red lips in the mirror, and then I looked at me in the mirror. My lips red too, just like Barbara's. How red lips make your face, how red lips make your face change. How they make you so fast into a girl. Gorgeous. I felt it first in my wrists. Heartbeat in my wrists. For a moment, no breath, the shame. Where could I run to? Where? But something else. That hot afternoon, as I was looking at my gorgeous red lips in the mirror, what I saw in the mirror was something I'd never seen before. A deep feeling filled up, feeling filled up my lungs, as if I hadn't ever really breathed. Such a thrill, and such a thrill. Such a thrill, and a thrill went from my lungs to all over in my body. Barbara reached inside the car cedar box again. When her fingers came to the purple-blue bottle evening in Paris, she pulled her hand away fast. That's when I knew my sister knew about evening in Paris, too. Then before I knew it, there was Mom's, there was Mom's rose from her gray wedding cake in Barbara's hand. She was pushing the brown, crusty rose around toward my mouth. Take a bite, Barbara said. It's still sweet. I was still dizzy from what I saw in the mirror and all the breath that was suddenly inside me, but I closed my lips, lips, my lipstick lips tight. There was no way my sister was going to trick me into taking a bite out of that rose. But then she put the rose to her mouth and took a bite, a little snap of confection. Barbara stuck her tongue out so I could see the bits of red rose on her tongue. See, she said, what are you scared of? Barbara dropped the wedding cake rose into my palm. I looked up real close at the rose and I saw what I already knew. All the little tiny bites out of the petals she'd been taking. My bite was too big, almost half, but I couldn't help it. It was my first time and I didn't know. Wow, Barbara said, wait till Dad hears about this. You're not supposed to hit girls, so I didn't hit Barbara, and it was a sin to get angry, so I started making some kind of fuss. I don't know really what a fuss was for me that afternoon, but what, was, what, I, but what, what I'd seen in the mirror and then all the air inside me making me dizzy, probably all I knew how to do was cry like a girl. It wasn't long when Barbara laid her arm across my shoulder. Her arm was warm. She patted my arm and touched the back of my head, put her fingers through my hair. No matter what, that always got me. Touch my head and I'll do anything. I was only kidding, Tommy. She said, I won't tell. In the back of my throat, the red rose tasted like dust. The other half of the rose was in the palm of my hand. All I could do was stare at it. The problem was what to do with the other half of the rose. Half a wedding cake rose was big trouble. I knew it was trouble before I went to Barbara, but after I looked at her, I really felt it. Barbara always had an answer ready. Barbara always knew what to do, and Barbara didn't know what to do. 
Who knows how long we stared at the half of red, brown, and wedding cake rose. Then Barbara picked up half of the, the, the half of the wedding cake rose with the thumb and two fingers and popped it into her mouth and crunched. It'll take her years to miss it, Barbara said. She chewed a while and said, and when she does, she, when, when she does, she'll just think one day when she was cleaning, she threw it out. She throws all kinds of things out when she wishes she didn't. All I could think about was a half of brown red rose that was now in my stomach and I'd poop it out tomorrow. Okay. I'm at time. Actually, that's, I just got half a page. When I looked my eyes up at the barber, she was holding the silver box in the, the, silver box in the air between us. Do you put your ring on too, Barbara asked. I always put it on. The pop on the silver box opened. Barbara reached in and took the diamond ring from out of its slot in the cushy purple velvet and slid Mom's diamond ring onto the thumb of her left hand. She pushed the ring down onto the knuckle so it fit snug at the base of her thumb. It fits best on the thumb, she said. Still it's a little loose. Barbara held out her hand and flipped her fingers with the diamond on their thumb. It looks better on me, don't you think, Barbara said. Mom's hands are so rough and red. It always amazed me how Barbara could just do things. Just walk up to things and do them. Just eat the half a brown, red, wedding, cake, rose. Just take out Mother's diamond ring and put the ring on her thumb and then say something about the world, our mother, as if it was a well-known fact. Come on, Barbara said. There's a party in the bathroom. Tom, you're time, you're time. <laughs> Sorry, man. No, it's okay. I just I just wanted to read half of it. And thanks for listening. <laughs>